what should I do to enhance my brain function right now? And I can't define that. I don't know if that means I need to be creative. I don't know if that means I need to have more, you know, reaction time. What, you, like, where would you start with that individual in terms of what you said at the beginning? I, you should make your own baseline test. Like, what should I be thinking about? And are there some tactics where you say, okay, I need all the information. I would really need all, I, but maybe two or three things here that start off that generally work pretty well. So generally, I'd think about when something like that comes to me and they say, I'm healthy, my brain works great, I'm, I'd like to improve it as much as I can or maintain it for as long as possible. The first thing is just to make sure if that first statement is true. Mm. And the easiest way to do that is with some simple blood tests, you know, determine some like nutritional status becomes really critical for the brain. We can, um, we can deal with poor nutritional status and the brain works just fine early in life. But if you're trying to you know, maximize everything, we know uh, vitamin D, iron status, magnesium, uh, B vitamins, omega threes, some of these and you know, glucose, glucose regulation, or at least just making sure you don't have prediabetes, you know, some of the basics. I would just make sure that all of that is sort of buttoned up. And that's, and that's easy to address. Would you mainly say those are energy metabolism markers? As long as your energy metabolism's fine, you're probably okay. Just, so there's an interesting thing uh, about energy metabolism in the brain and as it relates to brain structure as well, which is that it kind of follows a, a U-shaped curve. So at low levels of energy availability, we start to lose brain structure and brain function just because we don't have the energy to support it. And then we see a very clear energy toxicity effect as well. So if we have, you know, Prediabetes, diabetes, um, lipid dysregulation, you know, all the markers of energy toxicity, which are very, very common, right? Two thirds, if not more adults in the US have some version of that. Then you start to see a decline in cognitive function and brain volume as well. So yes, energy regulation is really important, but some of those nutrients have their own um, effects in terms of brain structure as well. So if you think about the relationship between B vitamins and omega-3s, this has been shown again and again and again that they interact. So if you have good status of one but not the other, you see no effect and vice versa. And this is where we've had trials that say, we give omega-3s, but they don't work. Or we give B vitamins, but they don't work, but they haven't taken the, the, the other into account. And it makes perfect sense because if you want DHA, the long chain omega-3 fatty acid, to sit in the synapse where you want it you know, to help communication between two neurons, it needs to first get into the brain, and that requires usually healthy uh, insulin sensitivity and energy regulation. And then it needs to go down the path of being attached to some kind of phospholipid, right? So choline or serine or ethanolamine. Uh, so you need that to be available. And then you need methylation to work so that these things get attached together. And that's where the B vitamins become important. So some of these things are directly structural, uh, as well as being you know functional, thinking about energy and, mitoc and mitochondria. I don't want to lose the plot. I'll come back to our avatar here in a second. <laughs> I have many follow-ups to that. I'll, I'll ask just one though. I don't think people would have assumed you can get a reasonable assessment of short-term, immediate, acute cognitive function from blood. Mm. So uh, right now, you probably can't. Um, you and I are in the process of <laughs> uh, uh, developing what should be a, a fairly simple uh, blood test that relates directly to cognitive function, dementia risk, also mortality risk. But like I said, critically, cognitive function right now. It's not going to be perfect, yeah. but it does relate generally to nutritional status and energy status, which, which makes perfect sense. So on top of that, I think you could um, you know, really button up the details with making sure that all, you have all your nutrient ducts uh, in a row. But in reality, if you're going to try, at the population level at least, try and predict somebody's cognitive function, you could see or if they have prediabetes or any kind of um, nutrient deficiency, they're going to have lower cognitive function. And there's, there's you know, dozens, hundreds of studies that show that. Do they need to necessarily be at a technical deficiency there? Or, or if they're, you know, say, a bottom 10th percentile, mm -hmm. they should pay attention. Do we have any insights into where those cutoffs start to lie for these metrics? Yeah, it, it probably, you're, you're right that in general, what we consider to be a, a deficiency nowadays is usually you're below the normal range, right? You're in the bottom 2.5% of some nutrient marker and right, you're like, you're going to have some, your day-to-day -day cognitive function is not your, ma your main issue, right? There's going to be even yeah, bigger yeah. problems than that. But there are some cutoffs for, for all of these things. Uh, well, in, in general, say blood sugar regulation, you want to make sure that 
normal fasting blood sugar, not pre-diabetic. Beyond that, there's probably not that much benefit from 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 being lower than that. But something like homocysteine is a marker of methylation status. Um, generally, if you went to a lab, the normal range is 13, 15. Um, five to fifth, five to third, like yeah, bottom yeah, end, really five, wide. high end, yeah. 13, 14, 15. And most people will say you sort of like target below 15. In terms of cognitive function, it probably needs to be less than 11. Uh, some people would go a little bit lower than that for things like cardiovascular disease risk. Um, but then... Uh, similarly for omega-3 fatty acids, if you do something like the omega-3 index, you probably want to be like ideally over 6%, maybe close to 8% or higher. Um, and that, like I said, those those two things interact. Yeah, I would say that in our experience, if you are above 9 to 10 mm -hmm. for homocysteine, we're we're looking very seriously at other things. Yeah. And an omega, un you'd be surprised how many are under 5. Yeah. Like very, 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 very commonly. This is why you see in those folks a little bit of basic multivitamin and omega-3 support. And all of a sudden, the brain fog is gone. Yeah. The, the decline, like it's just, it just disappears mm -hmm. from these people really quickly, which is, is really of no surprise. So um, coming back to us then, we check those blood markers. Uh, then what for that? So then you can make sure that the other lifestyle factors are sort of all in a row. And when we think about long-term cognitive function, there's kind of a, a framework for thinking about that. So sleep and all these other things, stress mitigation. Um, I'd, I'd definitely you know, look at all these other lifestyle factors. But if you're thinking about enhancing cognitive function, yeah. like I said earlier, I think stimulus is really the most important thing. Your avatar probably has quite a cognitively stimulating job, which we know uh, increases long-term cognitive function and decreases the risk of dementia long-term. So then I would think about a, a lifelong plan of ongoing broad cognitive stimuli. So if he's never played a musical instrument, he learns to play a musical instrument. If he um, all his exercise is in the gym and it's unimodal, then he picks up an open skill sport. He goes to play pickleball or learns to skateboard. God forbid, no more people playing pickleball. <laughs> Don't do that, Tommy. Um, if he uh, has never spoken another language, then he, then he learns a language. Um, some of these things, uh, it, it's interesting when you look across the literature, the one activity that probably ticks a lot of these boxes and seems to really support cognitive function as well as mental health is dancing. Yeah. And because that brings in play, I like it's it's an open skill, there's music, it's social. Um, so, he, so a dance class with his partner, right, yeah. would be a great, a great way to sort of integrate a bunch of these things together. If you enjoyed this clip, you can watch the full episode by clicking here.